Hey, what's up, folks? What's going on? Welcome to episode number 80 of the Spun Today podcast. I'm your host, Tony Ortiz. Thank you very much for listening. This episode is brought to you in part by Amazon. If you want to help support the podcast, you can do so by going to spuntoday.com and clicking on the affiliate links tab up at the top. On that tab, you'll see an Amazon banner. Click on it and do your Amazon shopping like you normally do. It won't cost you anything extra, but it will help support the podcast. In this episode, I speak about the KOTD Rap Battle Mass 3 event, watching two movies, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 and Girls Trip. I also speak about the protests in Charlottesville, Virginia, over the removal of a statue that was memorializing the Confederacy's top general, Robert E. Lee. I then speak about Solar Eclipse 2017, and lastly, the bout between Mayweather and McGregor. So stick around, got some dope shit in this episode. Alright, so first off, I fell off a little bit from like the whole rap battle scene. I see some sporadically still, you know, I watch them, but I've been out of the loop for a couple months. And I came back to a bunch of good battles, actually. They're something the first thing that caught my eye was a and I and I like the concept of this. Because it builds up like the momentum uh, the momentum and excitement of the genre as well as uh hyping up the next battle because I want to see like the full version of it's something called a secret battle where you know it's one of their events it's like a pay-per-view event you know similar to let's say like a UFC has a a pay-per-view event right and they have a, a headliner you know the the main event and then the co-main event and then they have a uh, a bunch of other like fights underneath the rap battles are following like that same formula that same format so there's a bunch of battles on a card and the main event etc but they introduce something called a secret battle and this well this is the first time that i saw it i'm not sure if it's if, if it was the introductory you know um first time for them uh, actually doing it but it's where nobody knows who they are it's two uh, battle rappers obviously and they go on stage they have masks on um they darken the room until they're on the stage and then when they're on the on the stage you know they bring the lights back up and they take off the masks and you see who they are and it was cool you know everybody got excited especially because it was like two big names and it was disaster and hollow the dawn and um what's cool is that it's only a one round battle so each one gets a turn and one round battles are common but um not in in this way this these are this was a one round battle that's set that's like a preview if you will to a full battle they're gonna have a full battle which is uh, three rounds so you know each one takes a turn back and forth back and forth back and forth um for a total of three three rounds uh, but this is a one rounder and serves as a preview. And I thought it was pretty cool. You know, it built up the excitement. It was, you know, two two of the top tier uh battle rappers in in the game and um and it was pretty dope. I like that. And what else? On Mass Three, which is the name of the event, which if I'm not mistaken is KOTD's biggest like biggest event. It's like their I don't know, if you're into like pro wrestling or something, it's like their uh SummerSlam or or Royal Rumble or whatever the fuck. Or, you know, it's like their Super Bowl event. And it's like their big card. Basically. They had another dope battle, which was Pat Stay versus Big K. And I gave it to Big K. Um, mainly because uh, Pat Stay slipped slipped up a bit. And K was, was more aggressive, like he usually is. And Pat was funnier, like he usually is. And um, it, it was a dope battle. Though. It was enjoyable. The other one that I liked was, or that I saw, which I also liked, was Arsenal versus Iron Solomon. Iron Solomon is one of the OGs, and Arsenal at this point is as well. But Iron is uh, like one of my favorites from back in the day when I, I first started watching Battle Rap. He was like one of the, the GOATs back then. And he recently came back, you know, it's probably like his fourth battle back after like a 
many many year retirement hiatus type of thing because he wants to go pursue um recorded music or you know try to pursue that full-time i guess or whatever it was good it was a good battle i give it to arsenal though um i thought his performance was better there was no slip ups or chokes on his part and he's kind of known to slip up and choke when you know it's a big stage a big battle um not every time but frequently enough that if it happened you wouldn't be surprised iron was good uh wordplay bananas as usual but a touch too verbose like a lot of shit went over my head it's the type that you would have to like listen to again to get and you know in the moment it's like you're not going to do that so i probably give it edge it to to arsenal and it's actually arsenal's second to last battle he's apparently retiring from battle rap and um his last battle is going to be against loaded lux that should be a really 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 good one i'll link to uh each of these battles in separately in the episode notes or if you want to go to spuntoday.com forward slash podcast forward slash 80 or 080 you can see all the episode notes there um or you know if you're just listening to this on your iPhone or Android or whatever app you use to listen to podcasts, it'll be right there in the episode notes for you to check them out. If you're not into battle rap or whatever, then obviously don't check them out. But I would say just look at the first like two or three minutes of the disaster versus Haldadon uh, battle. That's the one that I that I said had that new cool twist to it with the secret battle thing. And um, I thought that was dope. So just check that out. Let's see what you think about that. Yo, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 was really good. It was entertaining to watch. It was funny. It was a good movie. And honestly, I don't remember much of the first one. Like, much at all. Like, I remember the characters, but I don't remember, like, the storyline. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But I remember thinking that it was a decent movie, too. You know, like, I did not not like it. Um, But obviously it wasn't memorable for me or something from my fucking memory the this the Groot the little Groot the little baby Groot stole the movie and his intro the intro of the movie starts off with him and spoiler alert and like dancing around and stuff like that to some some of Chris Pratt's uh music that he likes like some 80s or 90s or whatever like some old school music and uh Groot is like dancing to it while they're like fighting some like big blob thing from outer space and he's fucking adorable it was so so funny and cute and and whatever that i wound up buying a funko pop doll of little baby Groot which is dope and funny but yeah it was an it was an entertaining watch i enjoyed it girls trip i went to go see at the movie theater and that shit was hilarious like every time there's for example bridesmaids was the last i guess like girl movie if you want to call it that that i saw that i thought was like super funny like that and prior to bridesmaids um the movie that well when brides were in bride bleh, when bridesmaids came out the movie that it was compared to was the hangover but like the girl version of and i thought it was you know like a like a stretch or whatever until i saw it and in terms of like funniness it, it was up there it was definitely up there and it was funny as hell it's a really really good movie so when girl strip came out it was, it was, uh, like, kind of, like, sold as, as funny as Bridesmaids, um, but it was, like, the, the black version, and I had, I held, you know, Bridesmaids, like, up there in terms of, like, funny, so I kind of thought it was just, you know, like, a gimmick selling tactic or whatever, but I liked everybody in it, Queen Latifah's in it, Jada Pinkett, Regina Hall, and Tiffany Haddish are all in it, all stars, 
you know, in their own right. And and they came together. The the chemistry between them was was off the hook. The story was cool. Regina Hall's a writer, which was like extra cool for me personally. And um, you know, and it's like touching, you know, moment and just like funny, funny, funny throughout like the whole thing. Tiffany Haddish absolutely stole the movie. And it's really cool because I like recently got into Tiffany Haddish when I got into um, the Carmichael show as well as uh, I saw like a bunch of interviews with her like on the Breakfast Club when um, around that time and uh, a few other interviews she she did Tony Rock's podcast uh, with Lil Rel on it as well and she had done like back in the day be- before I knew who she was. I like I knew she was a, a stand up comic and a comedy store comic because I had heard her in on like the Ice House Chronicles in the green room of of the comedy of the Ice House and like stuff like that. And I grew to like her, so I wanted like this movie to be you know good that much more, and it absolutely was. Like it literally was laugh out loud funny. Like, I was in the movie theater laughing out loud. You know, it's a quote-unquote black movie. Um, I guess because the majority of the cast is black. And so the the majority of the people that are not so, but the majority of the people that are watching it were also black. And, you know, the, the stereotype of, you know, black people, when they watch movies, they, they uh, you know, talk through them and, you know, laugh out loud and, like, stuff like that. That's true. And um, so I don't know if that had uh, something to do with me laughing out loud, like in the in the movie theater. But um, regardless, it was just fucking hilarious. And Tiffany Haddish actually has a comedy special out on Showtime, if I'm not mistaken, which I have not seen yet, but I plan to. And I'll um, tell you guys about it when I do. But regardless of all that, Girls Trip is also killing it in the box office. I think it's grossed like over a hundred million as of the date that I'm recording this podcast, which is August twenty second, twenty seventeen. So that's dope, man. It's really, really good for them. All right, now Charlottesville, Virginia, had some some protests by some white nationalist Nazi fucks that by now I'm sure you all have heard were thugging it out with their tiki torches Polynesian quote unquote tiki torches from from Home Depot that they purchased there are several important takeaways at least in my opinion from what happened in Charlottesville first and foremost someone died a 32 year old white woman was killed because a 20-year-old protester, white kid, that apparently couldn't manifest his emotions in any other way, decided to get into his car and run over a group of people that were protesting against the white nationalist protesters. He was that he was later arrested and sentenced with uh, charged with rather uh, second degree murder which again I said it before I'll say it again like the degrees and you know technically this technically that a piece of shit like that should just get literally like I don't know send him to like Kim Jong-un now and let him like sick the dogs that he used to kill his, his uncle or some shit on this fucking retard that killed a woman as well as injured 19 others also which has gotten like less coverage two police officers were killed in a helicopter crash outside of charlottesville because they were and they were monitoring it was because of the protest they were monitoring the protest from above our orange not so much in the closet anymore neo-nazi president has been deservingly criticized for not immediately saying that what the white nationals are like preaching and doing and saying and that the acts that that 
uh, transpired in Charlottesville should be condemned, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. His take on the whole shit was that there was blame to go around on all sides uh, because there were the protesters that were there and then the anti-protesters um people that were against these these like nazis or whatever you want to call them or white nationalists rather because i do get like the argument for like not calling them nazis because they're well i I actually no. well the argument is you know not to throw around the word nazi too much because you water down the word and then when it actually really should apply it doesn't really mean what it, you know, it doesn't have, like, that oomph behind it, but these are, you know, like, neo-Nazi wannabe fucks. They were there protesting the removal of a statue that was in the center of a town hall across the street from a, the, a courthouse. And the statue was, or is, rather, of the Confederacy's top general, Robert E. Lee. So Robert E. Lee was the head of the uh, Confederate Army, which was the Army of the South uh, that fought against the North during the Civil War. And they were fighting mainly, regardless of how you window dress it, to keep slavery going. So the statue in the middle of the town in front of a courthouse memorializing him is understandably disturbing. Clearly not to all, but to some. The best way I could describe it is by paraphrasing a woman that testified in front of Charlottesville's uh, city council when they were deciding if they were going to take the statue down or not. And she said something to the effect of, imagine that you had an oppressor, your family, your, your, your parents, your great-grandparents, uh, for generations had this oppressor that beat and raped and just diminished your existence in that way, tortured your family for years and years and years, 400 years. And they had a statue of this person, this entity, this being, or of that ideology, because that's what it becomes after that amount of time, right? Right. In the center of the city where you live. Like that has to fuck with you. I added the it has to fuck with you part. So. The story of how of why it was decided to get taken off is is something that resonated with me because it's a good. It's I guess like a silver lining, like a positive, a small positive in not in what happened, obviously, because this predates what happened, but just in, in the system as a whole, the political system as a whole. A young girl in college, a college student, petitioned the city council by gathering uh, hundreds of signatures in favor of taking down that statue. Now, it's not the first statue that has been taken down. There have been several other other confederate memorializing statues taken down throughout the south in similar manners and like confederate flags that were hoisted on government buildings and and stuff like that and if you i'm sure you guys are like remember that controversy and this is this is one that was petitioned by a college student you know a citizen saw something that she didn't like, decided to collect some signatures, take it to the city council, voice her opinion, and it worked. The city council heard her and the clear leverage that she had in the hundreds of signatures of uh, potential voters that can vote them in and out, in or out of office. So they have to, you know, pay attention in that sense. And they created a committee to review the situation and eventually voted to remove the statue. And they voted to remove the statue in February, but by March, before the statue could be removed, they, March 2017, they were hit with a lawsuit stating that under state law, they could not remove the statue. So the tensions continued to develop in charlottesville 
and this eventual protest as kind of like a last stand to stop the statue from from getting taken down this process is a result of that right and in terms of the the statue in and of itself getting taken down i i was kind of torn on that because part of me is like you can't rewrite history you can't and you shouldn't want to you shouldn't want to you know sugarcoat and erase the past and you know for generations moving forward act as if certain things didn't exist you know you know we have enough whitewashing of history where you know stories of minority minorities aren't told to the same degree that that stories of whites are for example and we don't want to now add another layer of you know pussifying history or or you know sugarcoating it or you know super PCing it history's history it's what happened we need to be reminded of what happened we shouldn't forget what happens to avoid it happening again so there's a part of me that's like you know it's statues shouldn't just be taken down in a way that you're going to erase and forget about history then there's another part of me that hears what that woman that petitioned the city council says and is like yeah absolutely you have a thousand percent point i wouldn't want to see a statue of someone that you know potentially raped my grandmother or great-grandmother or mother or whomever you know i wouldn't want that a statue like that you know in a in a glorifying memorializing type of way also it's kind of like what the fuck when i'm like taking the bus to go to work or whatever So I get that side of it too. Now, what I didn't know is that the statues, this is what I was getting to before, before I cut myself off. The statues weren't being taken down or or wasn't going to be taken down and like, you know, melted and thrown away. They're being relocated to museums, like a museum setting where the actual story of slavery can be told in its full context, not just a statue, you know, smack dab in the middle of the city on this pedestal but in the true context of who robert ely was and what he supported and what he was behind and that is i think a great reconciliation of at least my cognitive dissonance that i was having with that situation you know it kind of corrects for the issue of not erasing history and corrects for the issue of not being insensitive to those that are hurt by the statue. Because again, like just taking, taking, taking stuff down, and you know, acting as if it, it never happened, kind of reminds me of the movie. I'm not sure if you guys have seen it. Uh, Thank you for smoking. And if you haven't seen it, you should. It's a really good movie. But there was a senator there from Wisconsin that was hell bent on, on you know, he was super anti cigarette, and he went so far as to want to take classic movies like Casablanca and stuff like that and superimpose pictures of like a coffee or a candy cane in place of where cigarettes, you know, where the actors were like smoking and shit. And stuff like that is like ridiculous, I think. But this other way, this, this, way of creating some sort of museum to tell uh, that statue's history in its full context is, I think, a brilliant idea. So then our president is asked about this situation in Charlottesville. And his take on it is that there was a lot of blame to go around on all sides. You had the protesters that were there, quote unquote, legally with a permit and the anti-protesters that were there antagonizing and didn't quote unquote did not have a permit they were not there legally first off that's 100 percent wrong and incorrect in the episode notes if you want to check it out i link to several articles from the washington post snopes politifact etc corroborating an earlier story 
that the quote unquote other group was there legally. They did have permits. And there's the, in one of the articles, there's one that goes as far as saying that technically the the uh, white nationalist group didn't have a permit to be in the exact location that they were. They had a permit for like the adjacent park or whatever. But that that's a bit of reach. Point is, they were all there legally. They were all exercising their right under peace. Uh, peaceful is kind of a stretch when you're spewing hate speech but to peaceful assembly and freedom of speech under the first amendment the moment some dickhead gets in his car and decides that it's a good idea for whatever reason even if he had some altruistic weird ass rationale that you know he saw someone that was on fire and the only way to put the fire out and save that person was to get in his car and hit them literally no matter what no matter what's going on no matter what the situation the moment he decides to get in his car and run over dozens of people not even factoring the fact that he injured 19 and killed one that's wrong that's not okay. There's no scenario where that's going to be a tolerable act. We already know that six months in, Trump isn't a, an effective president. But his response to what happened in Charlottesville spoke more to who he is as a person and as a leader than, I think, anything that he's done to date. You know, all the pussy grabbing statements and the self aggrandizing and lies and bullshit. This did more than any of the, and anything prior, in my opinion. The moment your initial immediate gut reaction as a president is not to speak up against those acts, you're emboldening more of those acts. You're creating more of a volatile situation in a country that's already seeing a larger divide than in years past and where racial tensions are percolating. You're literally feeding that type of behavior. Vice did, an, and this, this shit has like a ripple effect. Vice did a, a piece on some German protests where the acts of Charlottesville had uh, neo-Nazis doing like some yearly protest that they have or the or yearly march that they have they were emboldened by the acts of Charlottesville I just don't get how someone's ego and narcissism and like isn't is a greater than the regard for others or the well-being of the country as a whole and even the world even like, the presidency of the United States can't even humble this motherfucker. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, Trump is my president. He's our president in that we voted him into, into office, and I believe in the political system. You know, it's, it's broken and needs updating, and I believe in following the, the process that we have in place and working from within to build it out, etc. But he's my president in the way that any man can be a daddy, but not necessarily a father. You know, like a deadbeat dad kind of thing. He's a deadbeat president. He's my president in the way that a druggy sibling that steals and beats family members is only a sibling by blood and nothing else. You know what I mean? It's like, you're technically our president, motherfucker. But you're not our president. You don't represent us. And the funny thing is that you don't even represent them, do you? You are placating and emboldening this base that got you elected. But it's all for personal gain. I know your type. I know, like, firsthand the cloth that you're that you're cut from the moment that it's not beneficial for you to continue 
propping up these white nationalist whack jobs. You'll flip on them like that. Probably around when it gets closer to election time and shit like that. Wouldn't be surprised. Re-election time. If you don't quit before then. Because there's bitch in you. It's just sad. It really does seem like a like sad existence. But rest in peace to those that lost their lives in Charlottesville. Fuck you. To those that preach or boast or embolden the violent acts. On a lighter note, America went dark for part of the day the other day. <laughs> uh, Eclipse 2017. I think it was called... I read, I read in a couple places it being referenced to as the great american eclipse um it's i'm not sure if that was the official name for it but at least on nasa's website it's called the the uh i don't know 2017 eclipse eclipse 2017 and it's not that eclipses are so rare they happen like every every few years but this particular type of eclipse that that you could see that I, I guess maybe this is why they're referencing as the Great American Eclipse, that it was going from one side of the, of the U.S. to the other. Um, and, and could be seen, you know, across the entire U.S. from Oregon down to, I think, South Carolina. Like, it took that trajectory from, like, coast to coast. Um, that type of eclipse happens uh, more sporadically, just to give you an idea. Uh, this one happened in 2017. And the next one is supposed to be in 2024. And then the one after that is supposed to be in 2049. And it was a Tuesday. I was uh, not a Tuesday. Today's Tuesday, August 22nd, when I'm recording this. And the eclipse was yesterday, August 21st, 2017. And I was at work and they reached New York. I was like, like I had YouTube playing on one of my, one of my screens, you know, uh, one of the corners of my screens and I watched uh, when it passed. Somebody was live streaming, and I watched when it passed uh, Wyoming, I want to say. Yeah, it was Wyoming, and it was pretty cool. And um, then when it got to around New York, which was around like 2 o'clock-ish, 2.20-ish, and uh, we couldn't see anything. We, we saw, uh, you know, we're in the city, so a lot of tall buildings. Don't really see the sun, but... We saw it getting a little darker, at least by uh, the windows that were on my side of the building. And then we found out that on the other side of of the office, the um, somebody had brought one of those glasses that looked like those 3D 80s glasses from back in the day. And um, that the sun was like directly overhead on the left side of the building. So pretty much everybody in the office like went over there and took turns sharing the glasses which are really cool, yo, super dark, you, like, you couldn't see shit with them, like, they were, like, pitch black, dark, like, darker than limo tints, type dark, and the sun was, like, right there, directly overhead, put the glasses on, look up, and you see it very, very clearly, as clearly as all the pictures that I'm sure you guys are, like, tired and sick of seeing already, but it was a pretty cool experience, especially since it was unexpected, to actually see it you know i thought i would just like see pictures uh, after it happened and try to see if you know somebody got a dope image from like a telescope or like something like that and like streamed it online um and somebody brought those glasses into the office and they actually work which was cool because i thought it was just like bullshit you know like who the hell's mass producing these bad boys <laughs> that they got like around so fast in time for the eclipse but uh, they actually worked, and it was pretty cool. Vice also did with, I, I think it was, I want to say Hamilton Morris. Um, in the Vice uh, weekly news show that they do, Monday to Thursday, they had a segment on the eclipse on Monday, and they showed it in a cool way for, you know, it was like probably like a five to ten minute piece. And it was dope. They did a really good job of it. It's called the Corona, apparently, when the moon completely covers the sun and you just see like the sides of 
the sun behind the moon just like radiating outwardly and like they showed that on the vice piece and that was pretty dope but yeah that was the eclipse 2017 money may worse worse verse mystic mac that's it the time is here the time has arrived it is the biggest fight potentially going to be the biggest fight in combat sports history the biggest money generator ever in combat sports history maybe in sports history but as a single fight definitely hell yeah uh because the one prior to that was manny pacquiao floyd mayweather fight and mayweather was obviously in both of them so smart fucking guy there but this is a fight that's gen going to generate potentially a billion with a b dollars which is in fucking sane floyd's due to clear between 150 and 200 million dollars conor mcgregor's due to clear uh 100 to 150 no 100 to 140 million dollars and ufc gets a a cut of mcgregor's portion which is like uh like a 40 million dollar cut or something like that and you know plus endorsements which is on the side of all that shit which is sick um did you guys see like all the polymana polymalanaji like footage that came out and stuff like that that leaked out that paulie's saying is is like cropped and it was funny he was like he was on a on a podcast and he was talking about it he was like he was like yo these motherfuckers i gotta give it to them that's some really really high level hollywood editing shit that they did with with that footage um because paulie did come out and say after sparring with connor because he he for those of you that don't know he joined connor's camp and he was brought in as a sparring partner and he pretty much sparred twice and wound up leaving like disgruntled and um long story short uh connor's side is saying that connor just like fucked him up for 12 rounds and and that they had no intentions of keeping him on anyway and they just wanted to bring him on to to beat him up because paulie was one of the um early talkers of shit against conor mcgregor when the fight before the fight was even announced as a real fight and um paulie thought that he was being brought on as a legit uh sparring partner and you know he was you know pissed when he found out that technically he wasn't and you know that he got off a flight and straight to boxing right away or something like that and and caught him off guard and did a lot of like connor supposedly did some dirty dirty tricks which i did kind of see in the in it was a cut video you could definitely tell that it was cut like sequence to sequence like and according to paulie this i can't confirm nor deny but according to paulie it was literally different rounds that were like put together and released but so it wasn't even like the different sequence within the same round but the you know there's and boxers you know always talk about this that you know there are some you know dirty tricks and stuff that you could get away with if you know how to do them and supposedly this was one of them and the way paul describes it you know he gets hit with a clean hit from connor and stumbles him a little bit but then connor like pushes him down like by grabbing like the back of his neck he pushes him down and as he's pushing him throws another punch and that video that's out where it shows connor technically like dropping Pauli malignaggi Pauli malignaggi attributes it more to that push more so than to a punch and uh Pauli, you know says that you know connor won some rounds and he won uh, other rounds and that he wants them to just release like the footage of the entire sparring session and the the UFC supposedly said that they will, but after the Mayweather fight, and um, and yeah, it's you know he said she said type of thing. The the clips don't look good, you know, to the naked eye, for for like Paulie's argument and stuff like that. Paulie looks Paulie looks like he got caught a bunch of times and he got fucked up, or 
you know, at least call with uh, some good combinations and stuff like that, which, you know, plays to the whole argument that uh, Connor, you know, can't box and he's going to get washed. You know, Paulie is a world class uh, fighter or boxer. You know, he's retired and not in the same shape, obviously, but he was a world champion. He's not just some Joe Schmo at, at the local boxing gym. And um, Connor, at the very least, was able to hit him with some combinations and stuff like that. So, so it's it shows promise for Connor's side. But the question is, can Connor do anything against the greatest defensive boxer of all time? I'm torn because it's you have the people that say he has no shot, and people that say he has a very good shot of quote-unquote knocking Mayweather out within four rounds or the people that say he will literally not get touched for 12 rounds uh, he won't be able to like touch Mayweather with like a punch there's people that literally have said that and others that say that Mayweather is going to knock him out they're literally arguing over the same point and I can see that same point being used on both sides which is Connor hasn't boxed He's not a boxer. This is his first boxing, professional boxing match or bout. But he is a striker, obviously. Or known for his striking in the UFC. But it's not within the confines of the sweet science of boxing. It's not within those rules. He strikes outside of those rules. He implements some of those rules. Uh, you know, in his MMA fighting but not all of them, and he's not confined to them. And he can use kicks to set up punches and elbows and feints, certain feints that would only work in MMA, etc. So the question is, is his style going to be so unorthodox that Mayweather can't download and under and interpret and understand his style to the point where he can do his wizardry of you know shucking and jiving and dodging all of his punches is his style going to be so unorthodox that Mayweather's just not going to know or understand or be able to maneuver which will then obviously cause him to get caught and knocked out by Conor McGregor or is the fact that he's so unorthodox and not within the confines of the rules of the sweet science against the master of that sweet science is he going to get so schooled because he's going to be like a fish out of water type of i don't know what i'm doing type of thing so this guy that knows what he's doing is going to school the shit out of me i don't know but the answer to that question will be answered august 26th well, I'm going to be in Caroline's on Broadway watching Russell Peters tell jokes and missing the fight. But we'll see it after. And I know it's going to be entertaining, at least. And I know a lot of motherfuckers are going to tune in. I will be very surprised if this fight does not break records. But we'll see what happens. And that's it, folks. That's all I got for you guys. And